so we'll start with uh, Dr. Saumya Panchanathan. She is a uh, pediatrician and the program director of uh, pediatrics uh, in Phoenix uh, at the Children's Hospital. She is going to talk about um, how to bring about change and the way we prime ourselves up as well as alter those around, the environment around. So both us and others are involved in bringing about change. Uh, you use an infrastructure that consists of yourself and your environment. And uh, she has a background in, info, in uh, technology and uh, informatics, and it will be a pleasure to hear her speak. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be part of this very inspiring weekend. Um, so I'd like to start, well, I don't have any disclosures, but I'd like to start with an inspiring prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. And I think every person in this room wishes to be an instrument of the Lord when it comes to helping their patients, serving their patients. But I would really like to take it one step further and use this attitude to really help us be the agents of change in our workplaces, the people who can help be the seeds of infection of this new attitude within our workplaces. And so when we think about what is the change we're trying to, um, trying to implement, we want to really advocate for compassion and care of the patient, the highest quality excellence of care. We want to engage and empower our patients to actually be the people who are actually taking care of their own health. We don't want to be taking care of their health forever. We want them to take ownership and look after their own health. And we want to be members of teams that work well together. And as well, we want to embody the well physician so that our colleagues, our staff, our students and residents can learn how to be that. You are much more inspiring as a person who does service in the workplace if you're joyful, if you're happy doing what you do, if you're not cynical you're much more likely to be inspiring to all of those around you. And so I am going to speak a little bit about some of the tools, but I really want you to think about them as not just that you are serving the patient, but you are serving your colleagues and you are serving those learners that you affect. Swami's leadership principles are be, do, see, and then tell that little triangle on the top that's just tell. So if we can be and do, we can become agents of change within our workplaces. And so while I think it's really important to get involved in service activities that are outside your workplace, if we can consider every day a service um, to all of those who are in our workplaces, I think we'll add a whole level of depth to our work. So a person named Tom Rath talked about well-being being a combination of our love for what we do each day, the quality of our relationships, the security of our finances, the vibrancy of our physical health, and the pride in we take in what we have contributed to our communities. And so if you really think about when we take good care of our patients, three things happen. Our love for our own work increases. The quality of our relationships to our, to our patients improves, and the pride we take in what we have contributed also increases. On the other hand, when we are more compassionate and humanistic, the patients give us back so much that that contributes to our well-being. So we contribute to their well-being and they contribute back to our well-being. And so this becomes this two-way street. Now, however, we have to add in the extra 
less enjoyable parts, shall we say, the, um, the business side of medicine, the whole piece where productivity comes in. These are realities in the system we work in. We don't have to let them make us become cynical. We don't have to let ourselves be drawn in and sucked into that either. So the, the, um, the productivity goals, the efficiency, you, can, you have to see people in 10 or 15 minutes, the uh, quality metrics that may or may not ref be truly reflective of the care you're giving, and also the EHR. I have to say that I'm an informatician. I have to say the EHR. Um, I personally believe it does not have to become a barrier between you and the patient. And there are ways to learn how not to let it become a barrier and how to use it in a relationship enhancing way rather than in a barrier to your relationship. So I think the answer to this conundrum, we're supposed to be compassionate, we're supposed to be well, we're supposed to be efficient, and we're supposed to be excellent, and we're supposed to use the EHR. This conundrum can be answered with mindfulness. I believe that that is the answer. And the definition that I use, and that I believe other people do as well, is that you pay attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, to the external things as well as your own reaction to them. And it really moves the observation, the self-observation from after the fact to right in the moment. And when you think about it, it is the pause, presence, and proceed method. So the pause. So I'm just going to go into, well, the quote is, the rush and present pressure of modern life is a form of violence. So nonviolence is one of the pillars of Swami's teachings. And to uh, succumb to the, to the pressures and speed of modern um, life is to have violence towards yourself. So that first um, pause is to just step out of the past, out of the future, where, and you leave the thoughts of the other patient. I think someone described the other patient, the previous one. And, um, and then you also leave the administrator. And then you also leave our home problems, the jobs that we have to do, everything at the door. Just like a coat rack is on the outside of a patient's room, possibly, you leave all of those outside and you go in so that only you are in the room with the patient. The second thing is presence and to be fully present um, where you are just allowing yourself to have a more authentic understanding. And this gift you can give to your colleagues. It does not have to be a patient. You can give this gift of presence. And one of the things I have found is when you sit and you don't jump in immediately when someone shares a problem, they have the opportunity to actually solve most of the problems for themselves. And you've given them that space, that comfortable space to do that for themselves, which actually empowers them to realize, I've got this. And it, you also have the opportunity to not, to sh demonstrate and embody not getting cynical with the system. And finally, proceed. It isn't navel gazing. It isn't where you sit and you just think about yourself and you don't do anything with it. It allows you to do shared decision making with the patient where you have understood all the aspects that the patient has. But you can also do this with the rest of your team and make them a more collaborative team just by the way in which you engage with the other members of your team. So when you think, I'm one of the um, associate program directors of our program, and I also teach medical students. So people have shown that empathy decreases over the course of the medical training process. And stress really increases. It's the stress of fatigue. It's the stress of feeling like you don't know enough at any one point in time. And so that 
completely increases all of that. And they show that medical students have much more depression than the general population. So when you look at mindfulness training in this population, um, they showed that it actually decreased those symptoms and it increased empathy and helped them stay empathetic for longer. It also improved attention and memory. And I think it brings together the potential contradictory demands that we were talking about earlier. In terms of possible benefits for patients, they've done some studies. Um, primarily in family medicine has been very um, forward thinking and engaging with mindfulness practice. And they showed that, the, uh, that this increased the patient-centered focus of an encounter. And the patients themselves rated the providers higher in their ability to communicate, probably because they were actually listening more. The other concept that I want to bring to your attention is the fact that this can also decrease the potential for medical error. People used to think that it was you had medical error because you didn't know enough. And that is no longer thought to be true. It is now thought that medical error comes from not paying attention. So the more you are focused on the here and now, the less likely you are to have less quality in your work and, less, and more safety problems. So just do this as a personal exercise as I go through them. Assessing your own personal baseline mindfulness. I tend to walk quickly to where I'm going without paying attention to what I'm experiencing along the way. How many of you have driven and got home having no idea how you got there? Because you were busy with some problem in your head. I find myself listening to someone with one ear and doing something at the same time. How many of us do it to our children? I'm a pediatrician. That happens all the time in families. Um, and it happens, educators do it also. We're staffing a patient, but we're also still thinking of some other thing. And I forget a patient's name, a person's name, almost as soon as I'm told it for the first time. Please forgive this one. I think I have this one a lot. Um, but I think also, going, getting away from the jokes apart, patient satisfaction is the other aspect that seems so contradictory to efficiency and excellence and evidence-based and all of that. And I think it's possible to do it all. Um, and if you look, mindful doctors were just as efficient as their less mindful colleagues. The other thing is cultivating mindfulness with our words. I hate this EMR. <laughs> Medical directors of insurance companies are always whatever. My call weeks are always so awful. We ourselves create the reality we experience with these words. And so if we are very careful with our words, we can not only impact how we feel at work, but we can impact how others feel at work. There was a study that actually looked at people and said, how happy are you? And then the second question that they could not reverse the order was, how many dates have you had in the last few weeks? And they found that the answers to these two questions were not different, were not related. If you ask them in the opposite answer order, how many dates have you had in the last few weeks, and then how happy you were, they were directly related. And so I think we set ourselves up for a good day with, with certain thoughts, and we set ourselves up with, for a bad day with certain other thoughts. And so I really think that um, they, the three are very related in giving us a, a good work environment. Finally, I would like to um, talk about these three as a Venn diagram. We think of work, then we think of service, and we think of fun. And the more we can integrate all of these three things slowly into a unified whole, I think our, our being will be much happier at work. So I'm going to have two questions. Where is our focus during our work day? And I'll just leave you a second, a few seconds to look at that. And the second, this is even more important. We talk about compassion fatigue. Does care and compassion, our care and compassion for patients, 
come from us or do they come from a higher power through us? We have to take off the lid and allow ourselves to always be the instrument through which this flows. We will never get compassion fatigue if we allow ourselves to be used through which compassion comes. And I leave you with the thought, a lantern is only needed where it's dark. And let us all become lanterns in our own workplaces. Sairam. <laughs>